Shalom, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are joined by Dr. James Baskin for his talk on the Jews and Japan, Inherited Discourses and Creative Adaptation in the Japanese Imaginaire. I also want to thank our partners at Ortzion for um, partnering with us on this event. And I'm going to post uh, Dr. Baskin's bio in the chat so that you can read more about him if you'd like. And I would love to pass it over to him. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, thank you for being here um, and for having an interest in this topic. So the um, title, okay, Jews in Japan, most people don't associate these two groups, um, but of course, and there isn't a pre-modern history, but there is a very interesting one in the modern period. So that's why inherited discourses, what the Japanese came to learn of the Jews uh, came from European discourse. And of course, we know that the European discourse on Jews and Judaism is not an over, overly uh, positive one. But yet the Japanese, of course, in their adapt, adaptive genius and reformulation uh, had their own unique approach to that uh, discourse and at times propaganda, um, often propaganda and how they, uh, what's the word, digested that. This is just a stylized picture. Just Mount Fuji is not that big from Tokyo. This is Tokyo. Maybe Mount Fuji is the size of this little uh, building right here. Um, on a clear day, you can see it, but this is just a stylized picture to give you the most famous symbol of Japan in the backdrop of, in front of Tokyo. Um, this is Kyoto, the old capital of Japan, 794 to, 11, uh, to 1868, over a thousand years. It's a very charming city. Uh, traditional culture is abounds. I lived here for a number of years. It's a, one of my favorite places. Um, and you still have scenes like this that you can find. Uh, very, very um, charming city. So let's talk about religion uh, in Japan and the, the belief system. And I say that a set of beliefs is not accurate. That's why it's there. Um, religion in the West is a is a well a faith statement, but before that, it's more of a of a self identity. I am fill in the blank, and people say, "Oh, okay, so that's what you are." In Japan, that that whole paradigm doesn't really hold up. It's a very different um, I, uh, religious paradigm. In fact, the word religion didn't exist in Japan until the modern period, um, when the missionaries came back. They were kicked out for a few centuries. And they came back and they had this thing called religion they had to, you know, to talk to the Japanese about. So they used the word shukyo, which is two characters that mean either house or sect and teaching. Because they didn't have an umbrella term for religion. It's just not in their in, in their mind. Uh, they have bukpo, Buddhism. They have Shinto, Shintoism. They have judo or jukyo, Confucianism, but not religion. So that's one area. And Japanese religion is very, very flexible, very embracing, very open. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, very much so that the idea of an exclusivistic religion that has you know, a set of beliefs that you can't diverge from or a set of practices is very hard to kind of really process, uh, speaking in, in, in general, you know, in broad brushstrokes, but in, gen in, in general, um, very much so. So Shinto is one of the is often called the native system of thought of of, of, of religion, if you want to use that word. Uh, it is this is a tori, a bird perch. The two characters mean li literally bird perch. You see it before shrines. It de delineates sacred space. Um, in uh, Kyoto, there's a Fushimi Nari, this famous place where we have a thousand of these, and you see them in commercials, people going through those. But it's it, it's a it's a gate basically. Uh, this is a very famous. Here's another one. This is the Heian Jingu in Kyoto. So let's look at some salient characteristics of Shinto. So there's an emphasis on the identity of the Japanese nation with the imperial family. Uh, so the Japanese, you know, in the myths, the founding myths, they believe that they're descended from the sun goddess, which makes them a kind of chosen people. Uh, and they see the emperor as, historically speaking, as, you know, a god, a grandchild of one of the gods, which means the Japanese people themselves are descended from the gods. Uh, and during state Shinto and the period of militarization, say 1868 to 1945, this was the state ideology. Uh, so this, this identity is very strong. And they descend from the ancestral kami. Kami is the word that's translated as gods. It's not a great translation because you think of Zeus throwing lightning bolts and cavorting with human women. But a kami is something which is worthy of awe. Mount Fuji is a kami. Uh, a, a, an old tree, that's, you know, a very big tree could be a kami. Ancestors are coming. So there's it's a broader term, and God's really isn't a very good uh, translation. Uh, affirmation of life, where things are natural, they're not it's not good versus evil. Um, and also, this is very big, the reverence for the bright and pure. The pure purity is a huge theme in Shinto, and it pervades the culture. Uh, Jack, taking your shoes off, 
you leave the dirt from the outside, outside, you have the gangkan, which is this liminal space between the outside and the inside of the house. And then you switch your shoes there. And then you the, the verb for going into a house isn't entering, it's agaru, to go up, to enter, to ascend to the house. Um, so this idea of, of purity and is very, very important in Shinto um, and uh, pervades Japanese culture as a whole. Oh, here's the tree with the shimin, shiminawa. The shiminawa designates something which is holy or sacred. And then the other great tradition uh, in Japan is Buddhism. Okay, um, This is the great Buddha of Kamakura. That's the name Daibutsu, Kamakura Daibutsu. Uh, and it's, I brought my students here when I was teaching in Japan, my seminar students, on these school trips that we do. And uh, this is just something everybody goes to. It's one of the more popular tourist attractions. You can go inside and look out the uh, the eyes and stuff in the back. It's about 30 feet high, maybe. But Buddhism is the other Pan-Asian, it's a Pan-Asian tradition that uh, goes, traces itself back to the historical Buddha, sixth uh, century BCE. And in East Asia, you have what's called Mahayana Buddhism, okay? Southeast Asia, Theravada, which is more traditional. It's closer to the, what the historical Buddha would have taught. Theravada is a translation way of the elders. Mahayana is kind of a misnomer in the sense that Maha means great, Yana means vehicle. So the Mahayana people, which is a later development around the beginning of the common era, uh, call what's Theravada, the Hinayana, the small vehicle, okay? It's kind of like Old and New Testament. Okay, those are Christian terms. Jews, we call the Torah, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible or the Bible, because that's our holy book. Uh, Christians, of course, have the New Testament, which means they have to have the Old Testament. Some Jews, you know, do use that term because it's perhaps they just absorb it, but it's it's pejorative, of course, mildly or depending on how you look at it. But it, it, similar to that, this is, you know, Mahayana, the great vehicle and the lesser vehicle. So the lesser, quote, the Theravada people do not say we're the lesser vehicle. OK, but East Asia, Japan, Korea and China are of the Mahayana tradition, which is you know, uh, has a huge cosmic scheme, infinite number of Buddhas, infinite number of universes, um, and uh, the Zen school, Zen Buddhism, and the Pure Land school, this all belongs within the Mahayana uh, uh, world. Uh, this is the uh, Todaiji temple in Nara. It's the biggest wooden structure in the world, I believe. Uh, the Golden Pavilion in Kyoto, and some Zen monks on their daily rounds are begging, just Part of their training, they beg for food. They can be fed, of course, in the monastery. They're from the Engaku Temple. It says Engaku Soldo here. Uh, it's just part of their, uh, their training. So I talked about Japanese openness to different things and how flexible they are at, with religion. And this is an example of a popular manga. Um, a manga is a comic book, basically. It's turned into a TV series. And it's called, the English title is Saint Young Men, but this character here means holy. It's red se or hijiri, but here they gloss it as sainto. Saint, uh, Onisan, okay? And it's a story of Jesus and Buddha as college roommates. Um, in some countries, this would be blasphemy. It would be just unthinkable. In some cultures, it'd be, ah, you know, bad taste, they think. But in Japan, it's fine. And people like it, and they have a good time with it and do things, you know, what college roommates do or roommates do, right? So this is an example of, of this open stance, this non-adherence to any one, you know, dogma to the exclusion of, of being open to other things. Here's an example of um, another example. This is called the uh, Anibara Kyokai. Uh, and uh, you have a large star of David here, um, uh, right here. You have a menorah and you have a true crucifix with Jesus on it. You have another star of David down here. And this is a church, okay, it's a church. Uh, here's a picture of a school trip going, you have the school students here, the big, big menorah right here. And you have a rose garden with Anne Frank. So uh, Anne Rose Church would be the translation, Ane no Barakyokai. Um, and why do they have this? Is it a place where Jews worship or no, it's not. But wouldn't this be nice to have a church that supports and celebrates Judaism and Anne Frank, so that may that never happen again. Uh, she's a very popular figure. Her diary is beloved in Japan. It's read by many, many people. So it's a bestseller all the time. So, you know, why not just add Anne Frank to your church? So this is just an example. Um, some people would be offended by this. Some people would not. But uh, in Japan, this is something that they don't see any problem with. And they see it as accommodating. So let's switch to pre-modern times. This is just a print here of the 15th generation children uh, with his feudal lords, with daimyo, literally translated great names. These are the feudal lords who are in charge of a thief. And here's the shogun uh, right here. 
So we're going to talk about pre-modern Japan then. So Christianity did make its way to Japan in 1549. Francis Xavier stepped up ashore in Japan. Uh, he said, within two years, this country will be Christian. He thought they were amazing. They were curious. They were open. They were, they were literate. They were um, very interested. Uh, things didn't go the way he predicted. He left two years later. There was a period they called the Christian century where some daimyo, feudal lords, converted, perhaps for material reasons, perhaps for military reasons, perhaps for technological reasons, perhaps for pious reasons. Uh, and by fiat, if the feudal lord converted, that everyone in his domain would be nominally Christian. So the numbers are inflated, 300,000, a million Christians in 16, the early 17th century, 16, 1600, late 1500s. Um, but slowly, the Japanese became a little bit disenchanted. Uh, first of all, the idea of allegiance to Rome, um, which is not the Bakfu. The Bakfu is the military government headed by the shogun. Um, also, the idea of this religion where they'd ask, you know, ancestor worship, ancestor veneration, they'd say, well, okay, this works for me, perhaps, but what about my ancestors or my mother or father who died? And they say, oh, well, you know, too late for them. They're in hell. But here, save yourself. That doesn't really translate. Um, in Japan, you know, you have the idea of transference of merit in Buddhism. You can transfer merit to somebody who has died. So this was also hard to, to accept. Um, and there's other reasons as well, but historically speaking, ancestor veneration, cultures that, an, that venerate their ancestors in China, Japan, have a difficult time with, with, Christi with, with Christian missionaries, um, you know, with Christianity as a whole. Um, so this is a, a painting here where, of the, uh, the, martyr, the martyrdom of uh, a certain number of padres, Portuguese and Spanish padres, as well as the Japanese here being beheaded, as you can see, they... Uh, by 1614, Christianity was proscribed. It was outlawed. And by 1630, it was effectively eradicated. Uh, very, very, very harsh suppression. Um, there's no other country in the world that was that had such a harsh and successful suppression of, of, of this uh, of the missionaries um, in the sense that they left. They didn't, they didn't come back for a couple centuries. Uh, Christians went underground, but there was a small number. They called them hidden Christians, and they came up again during the modern period with a very altered Christianity. That had even you know evolved further. So uh, Christianity is they had exposure and this they had they didn't talk about Jews much because the Jesuits wouldn't let Jews join and they went back a certain number of generations if they had a a, a converse, so somebody who converted in the family. So uh, they didn't have much discourse with Jews yet, but this was their first exposure to uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition. If you want to use that word, here are some of the uh, Jesuits in Japan. So Japan effectively shut off from the world. There was an island in Nagasaki where you could trade with the Dutch and the Chinese, uh, but it was effectively, you know, you couldn't really leave. You couldn't go to foreign countries. They couldn't come and trade with you in the mainland. So it was closed off. Um, the term used is Sakoku, you know, literally the closed off era, the era of national isolation. But in 15, uh, 1854, Commodore Perry in the United States came with the black ships as they call them in Japan. You can see how the Japanese imagination has created, look at them like these monsters. Uh, the Industrial Revolution had happened in Europe and Japan was left behind. So technologically speaking, they didn't stand a chance against these, these, cannon, these cannon ships, these gunships. Uh, so they, they had no chance to, but to open up uh, at the barrel of a cannon. So they did in 1854, this is Commodore Perry. And he said as well, um, this has been something you find throughout Japanese history when people come starting the Jesuits, uh, the Japanese are remarkable for their inordinate curiosity. They're strong, very, and it's today you see it. They're very curious about other places, other peoples. How do you perceive them? What's your impression of Japan? Very open to um, constructive criticism in a way that you don't really find uh, very often in, in other places. So they took very well to Western fashion. They just, when they go after something, they go after wholeheartedly. The whole, when soccer was really popular in 1990 or so, the whole country just soccer became a national, you know, uh, it was a, bo a boom like you can't imagine. And with the Meiji Restoration, 1868, the emperor was restored to power. He was now the de facto ruler of Japan. He'd been a figurehead for 700 years, powerless basically. Um, now the Meiji emperor come, came back into power. He was for all intents and purposes an absolute, you know, ruler. Uh, they adopted Western fashion, um, Western style, Western industrial methods. 
Um, they wanted to militarize, they wanted to get a European style military. They were excellent students of everything they studied. They sent delegations to the United States, to Europe. Um, today in Japan, if you look at the uh, school uniforms of certain schools, it varies. Some wear suits, but some wear the Prussian military uniform that they got during the Meiji period. Um, they still wear it today. I've been in schools where the students, the men, you know, they wear the they wear this something like that looks just like this. Except there's one there's one column of, of buttons all the way up to the top with that collar that goes up, and it's the Prussian military uniform. Women, you know, the, the girls always wear sailor suits. It's just uh, it's just something that most schools they wear their uniforms are sailor suits. But uh, this is um, you know from this period, so they studied education, military matters, uh, politics, everything they could they could absorb they uh, adapted wholeheartedly. Uh, this is the, just a print of the burgeoning Japanese army built along modern lines. And with such, they were one country in East Asia that did not, that was never colonized. Um, and they were very, very good students of the Westernization. They, within a few decades, they could embark on their own conquest, which is what they did. And in 1894, uh, they have the first, with the Sino-Japanese War, the, Chinese Japanese War, uh, where you know Japan is a small country compared to China. It's about one twenty fifth is the land mass of China. So they you know they wanted some more land. Um, Japan is seventy four percent of the country is mountainous. Uh, there's not as much living space as even the land would suggest. So they they thought okay we're going to invade China and they did. And uh, it wasn't a very difficult military victory for them. Um, they carved out a part of northern China, Manchuria. Uh, within a, a number of years, 10 years, they were so emboldened to attempt to fight with um, the Russian Empire, uh, with, 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 with Russia. Uh, here's Manchuria. Here's, um, as you can see right here, you have Manchuria. Here's Korea, here's Japan. So Manchuria was, a puppet government was set up and um, they started building infrastructure and became part of the Japanese empire. And within 10 years, they, they, have, they were in war with Russia. So a major European power. And they defeated Russia, which was groundbreaking. A Asian people, an Asian country, just a few decades out of their feudal era, defeats a major European power. Uh, today, even it's, you know, I've seen interviews and people talk of other countries. They say, "Oh, we're very inspired by your victory." Gandhi talked about the Russian about the the victory, the Japanese victory. It was. The, the colonized peoples can fight back. The colonized people, they were never colonized, but within that cultural sphere, they can defeat the white European. So this was a very, very important victory in the sense of all war, of course, is held, but in the terms of the, the zeitgeist of the time. So this changed, of course, the Japanese trajectory of, of their self-image as well. Uh, so we come to our first Jew in the story, Jacob Schiff. He was a uh, very successful banker. He was born in Germany. Uh, came here to the United States as a relatively young man uh, and um, was a, a juggernaut in the banking world. Uh, and he financed the Japanese war. He gave them $200 million at the time, money at the time, which was instrumental in securing the Japanese victory. It was a very brutal war, but those resources tr translated directly into a, a huge boon for, for the Japanese war effort. He was no fan of the czar, of the pogroms, of the constant. Uh, blaming of the Jews for every ill of society. So he wanted to support Japan, uh, much like uh, Haim Solomon, who with uh, Robert Morris um, uh, financed a large part of the American Revolutionary War, which was responsible, which was a huge factor in the, in the victory of the group that became the United States of America, that the ragtag army and that, that, that was a large part funded by uh, Haim Solomon. So you have a very similar dynamic here. Uh, so Jacob Schiff was feted by the Japanese government. He was brought to Japan. He met with the emperor, had lunch with him in the imperial palace, something that no Japanese would ever do. He wasn't part of the imperial family or that entourage. They didn't look at the emperor. They didn't interact with him. He was you know, a god. Um, but he welcomed Jacob Schiff, treated like a hero, fed in the, you know, and um, even today, he still is somebody who people will know because of his importance in this um, conflict. So militarism continued to, uh, was the, continued in Japan, the Japanese empire expanded. You can see that at uh, its height here, uh, Manchuria, the population centers of China, well, well inland as well, um, Southeast Asia, Indochina, um, Dust East Indies, which is mainly what is Indonesia today, 
um, all the way up to the Midway Island, Marshall Island, it's a huge area. Um, you can see that Pearl Harbor is not so far. Um, it, how, you can see how close it was actually to the limit of the Japanese empire. And of course, in December, on December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked and the United States declared war on Japan. So when Japan was in control of Manchuria, they came into contact with a Jewish community, a pretty sizable one, about 13,000 Jews. Uh, they had their own synagogues, their own schools, uh, their own um, shopping, I mean, grocery stores. It was a real community. And Japan had not really had any substantive contact with Jews. So this is their first contact. And they had, um, of course, white Russians there as well. Now, the white Russians had fled Russia because of the Bolshevik Revolution. They were blamed, they blamed the Jews for that because many of the Bolsheviks were Jews, well, ethnically Jewish. Uh, they were supporters of the Tsar, which, in, which entailed anti-Semitism as well. The Jews were at fault uh, for all the ills. And of course, the that um, forgery, that vile forgery, the protocols of the elders of Zion was passed to the Japanese. Okay, that text, of course, for those of you who might not know, it is started under Napoleon, it was created under Napoleon III, brought to Russia, the secret police rewrote it to make it into this fantastical story that the head rabbi, um, it meets with the 12 elders of each tribe uh, at the Jewish cemetery in Prague, and they're going over their plans for world conquest. So, you know, Yankala, you take the south, uh, um, the David, you take the north, I mean, you know, something like this. But the white Russians thought it was real. Well, they believed it. They said, this is true. And they gave it to the Japanese and they didn't know what to make of it. They had no reason to doubt it, no reason to believe it. So they read it and took it at face value. Oh, I'll come back to this. Uh, as I was going to say, um, the Japanese uh, did um, partner with the worst actors of all during the war, World War II. But uh, there was virtually zero in the way of um, military cooperation or material cooperation. It was basically a pact on paper. But uh, when the Germans did ask, when the Nazis did ask uh, Japan to deal with the Jews harshly, uh, in every case they refused, and I'll read some of those passages. So Inizuka, uh, Inizuka Kurishige was a naval captain, and he was, came across the, this Protocols of Elders of Zion. And he was very interested in it. He was very concerned. Uh, and in one of his communications, he used a term that was picked up by some American commentators. He called, he used the word fugu. Okay, fugu is the blowfish, uh, which is very, very yummy, delicious when it's prepared correctly. But if it's not prepared correctly, it can kill you because it's highly toxic. The liver is very poisonous and people die every year. Uh, I've had it a number of times. It's good, but not my favorite sushi, sashimi actually. But anyway, he used the term that the Jews are like the fugu. And what does that mean? It means that, uh, here's a Japanese translation of actually the book that was written in English. Uh, river pig is the word for fugu. This blowfish is the characters that represent it. Keikaku, so the fugu keikaku, the fugu plan, uh, written by Marvin Tokayer and Mary Swartz. Okay, these are Americans who wrote this book. But here's the, uh, here's the, the fugu, okay? It uh, has quite impressive lips for a fish. Um, it blows up like this, it's not always this big, but this is what it looks like when it blows up like that. And, um, and this is the, what they use to describe the Jews. You bring them in right, things are gonna be great. They'll help us, they'll help us will flourish, but if not, they'll end up killing us. So this is what the, uh, that, this is the origin of that term. So there's some other Japanese that had a very interesting take on the Jews as well. Um, Japanese Christian, there were Japanese Christians and they were part of the elite society. It wasn't a huge number, but there's a certain number of them. And they had a very interesting take on, uh, on the Jews. Now, of course, around this time, uh, there, was, there was a buzz in the air, the Jews returned to their homeland. Uh, the Balfour Declaration was signed in 1917. This, was a, this is something that was known in Japan as well. So there was a trend among evangelical Christians in Japan, Protestants, uh, that the Japanese military victories were, a, were divinely ordained. This was, they saw Jesus about to perhaps reappear. This was ordained, this was divine providence that they were having all these military victories. So he th saw the military victories as a way to help the Jews in the cause. Um, They're preparing the way. Um, the Kadajuji, this figure here, um, he, he worked actually as a, as a minister in Japan. He studied at the Moody Bible College, what was became the Moody Bible College, a evangelical um, institution in, the, in Chicago. And he established his own evangelical sect. Uh, part, 
the, it was about helping the Jews realize the return to the, um, their homeland. He looked to the book of Revelation and the Christian scriptures, 7 2, Revelation 7 2, where it says, quote, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, etc. Um, he saw Japan as that angel from the east, bringing with, with the seal of the living God. And that uh, its divine mission again was to, was to, was to help the Jews uh, in their return. He looked to Psalm 84, where it says, For the Lord is sun and shield, the Lord bestows grace and glory. Now he saw Japan as the sun and the shield as the shield of David, the seal, the, the star of David as the shield. Um, the idea of Japan as the land of the rising sun, of the sun goes way back uh, in the seventh century. An emperor from Japan wrote to an emperor in China saying from the emperor of the land of the rising sun to the emperor of the land of the setting sun. Didn't mean anything by it because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. China's to the west of Japan, but he took great umbrage at that. But this idea of Japan as the sun, uh, the shining sun, the example, this is what he, he, he drew on as well, and that the Jews were the shield. He wrote a book uh, called, an, a pamphlet called The Unknown Nation, where he talks about the small numbers of Jews, but yet they're very prominent in all the different fields. He writes, us Asiatics have, have had very little contact with the Jews because they've been living in Christian countries of Europe, but these Christian countries have mocked and made fools of these poor forsaken people, despisingly calling them Jew, Jew. However, they can never get the upper hand of them as they are so superior in every way to any other people, end quote. So you see, it's a very sanguine, to say the least, uh, perception of Jews. And he sees, also believe that many people did, that the Japanese were descended from the Jews. Okay, so the lost tribe of Israel had made its way to Japan and the Japanese were in fact descended from the Jews. Then you have people like Hiraizumi Kiyoshi, who spent some time in Germany in the 1930s, early 1930s. He came across, he had some Jewish friends uh, that he got, came relatively close to. And he believed from what he learned that the power, that the strength of the Jews' power was the preservation of their culture, their rituals, uh, their liturgy, their prayers, everything. This is what he saw as holding them together for 2000 years outside their ancestral home. And he looked to the Jews as an example of what Japan should do, that if Japan could adopt a similar kind of um, spirit, you know, national spirit, that they would be able to flourish as well. And when Japan lost the war, World War II, uh, he looked to, he, he blamed it on a, a lack of this spirit that could, that could have, you know, helped them um, prevail. Then you have figures like Sugihara Chine, uh, very well known. Uh, I'm sure many of you know who he is. He issued thousands of visas, uh, travel visas to Jews who were escaping uh, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, yeah, Lithuania, uh, Hornos, yeah. Uh, and he went against the orders of his superiors. He, he ruined his career through those moves. But of course, he said at the time, you know, I, I just could not but help these people. He gave thousands of visas out and they went to Japan, from Japan to Shanghai and were able to evade the Nazi killing machine. Um, he, um, he became a very, in 2016, 17, when I was, before I moved back to the U.S., when I was living in Japan, he, uh, there was a TV special, a TV movie about him and some other specials. He kind of was like the hot topic. So much so that when they do these, they do these um, like surveys every year, who's the most admired Japanese in history? And oftentimes it's Shoto Kutaishi, the seventh century, sixth century, uh, like kind of philosopher king, if you want to call him that. But that year it was Sumi Harachiune, the most admired Japanese in history, in Japanese history. Um, because they were very proud of the fact that though they were aligned with the Nazis, they didn't turn the Jews over, they, they protected them, they didn't, you know, um, persecute them. So he saw that uh, the Japanese were very proud of that, and he was the number one most admired Japanese that year. So I don't want to say that there wasn't any anti-Semitism, though. I want to make clear that there was some, uh, but it wasn't systemic, it wasn't systematic, and it didn't filter down to the common people. I mean, I, I spent roughly 20 years in Japan, and I've had zero anti-Semitic incidents with Japanese. If anything, they're curious, they wanna, they wanna know more. They don't know what, what's a Jew, how's it different from a you know, Christian? So it's a very, very different um, you know, paradigm. It, that kind of curiosity was, was very refreshing for me after growing up in an area which was you know, quite anti-Semitic and having to deal with that. Um, but so there was anti-Semitism, but it was largely, um, among elites, and it was localized. So this book is quite good for those who want to do some more reading, Jews in the Japanese Mind by David Goodman and uh, Masanori Miyazawa. And so just showing you some 
examples. This is a, uh, a pretty well-known um, journal, uh, the Kishi Dokohon, the history reader. And they had a special issue, which they translate this here as uh, um, the Jews enig enigma of the world was here at Seikai Nazmi Yidea, which that's, that's what, what it means basically. And just a special issue devoted to this. You have a rabbi looking guy here in the cover, you have a scroll with a star of David, Empire State Building. And then here, the first part, Daichibu, says, Is there a Jewish plot to take over? You know, to, to, is there a Jewish plot? That's what it asks. Then here, right next to it, it says, The Jewish plot, the world domination. I guess they answered their own question. And then the second part here, it says, Are the Japanese and the Jews from this common ancestor? So rather, you see this in Europe. Yeah, it's very anti-Semitic. But in Japan, they're saying, is this true? Do they have a plot? And then the second part of the thing says, are we Jewish as well, perhaps? So it's a very, not steeped in anti-Semitism in, you know, that you have in Europe. The Japanese, um, what might perceive, seem as anti-Semitic is not of the same nature as what you get in Europe, of course. Um, there was some anti-Semitism again, like I said, but partly, oh, sorry. That was because of Shakespeare, believe it or not. Um, the Merchant of Venice was the first play that was staged in Japan, 1885. It was also uh, the most popular one. And today still is very popular. Um, and of course, Shylock uh, in that play is the anti-hero, is not uh, really, um, unless you're a very sensitive reader, you can't see much positive about what Shakespeare is doing with Shylock. Uh, it's quite overly, it's overwhelmingly negative. Um, so, that's also something which um, came, you know, was a factor as well. Uh, during the war, you have some political cartoons. Uh, here's, of course, if the Jews rule the world, then obviously America, which is a powerful country, must be ruled by a Jew too. So here's FDR with a horn and a, a torch here it says doksai, which means dictator. And then it has here burning the paper of minshushugi, which is democracy. So you have the Jew with a single horn sitting on top of the Statue of Liberty, burning democracy with a, a torch. Um, here's some other, other ones that were doing the war. Momotaro is a uh, legendary figure born of a giant peach. Momo is peach in, Jap in Japanese, um, who slayed demons in, in the stories. And here's FDR with two horns this time, uh, claws and being slayed by uh, Momotaro. And another one, here he is clutching a bag of money, wearing a star of David, as he's uh, uh, at the point of a Japanese katana. Uh, sword. So um, FDR uh, is still considered Jewish by some people in Japan. Uh, here's an example, Yudea no Seikashi Haisenyaku, this title, the, Jap the Jewish plot for world domination. You have Henry Kissinger, okay, secular Jew, FDR, not a Jew, um, uh, Karl Marx, uh, converted to Protestantism, Einstein, proud Jew, Lenin, a quarter Jewish, but not Jewish in a meaningful way, did not accept it or practice, obviously. Stalin, not a Jew. And Charlie Chaplin, not a Jew either. But this, uh, this is when they have Jews on the cover, here's who they chose. So it's an interesting um, example. Now, this theory of the Japanese Jewish common ancestry is interesting because many people hold, are quite interested in this. They wonder if there's something there. But, you know, my job isn't to... Um, debunk anything cynically, but just to look at it a little super, you know, a little deeper dive, and you can see that there really isn't anything too much these theories. Uh, here somebody has a Jewish man in a white talit wearing tefillin, um, his phylacteries, and blowing an ebex horn, um, his first shofar here. And here you have um, a Japanese man in his white suit with blowing a conch shell, hodagai, with a little black box, what well, looks like a box on his head, but it's actually a sake cup. So it's very easy, very convenient for you to drink your sake or whatever, you just take the cup off your head, drink it and put it back on. So you see, there really isn't much in the way of similarities here. Um, this white is what the mountain men wear, the Yamabushi. It's a, um, well, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So another thing people point to, Jews will say goy, the goyim, the non-Jew, regardless of where they live, they're citizens, they're not citizens, those who are non-Jews are goy. So it's not based on citizenship of the country you live in, non-Jew, us and them. Japanese too use the word gaijin or gaikokujin or gaijin, which literally means outside person or foreigner, but it doesn't really mean just that. Because when I've been overseas, whether it's in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, Europe, and I see other Japanese and I hear them say, ah, I'm a gaijin. You know, they don't say, oh, that Frenchman or that, they say, I'm a gaijin. 
meaning that non-Japanese. Okay, they're not thinking passport, they're thinking that non-Japanese. So again, not everybody, but mostly uh, very, very common. So they, people point to this. Do I think it's convincing? Not necessarily, but it's, it's interesting. Okay, so as you know, the Lost Tribes, um, as the story goes, 722 BCE, uh, in the war with Assyria, the 10 Northern tribes are captured and carted off and uh, spread around the world. Many countries have their own theory, their own legend of being part of the Lost Tribe. There's a great deal of prestige that adheres in being associated with the biblical story. Uh, so many countries do have their story. Um, and the Japanese Jewish common ancestry theory is one of them. You can check out the Wikipedia page uh, if you like. I save time, I won't um, read this. Um, so part of this, you see early on, this came from, um, there was a foreign commentator, Nicholas McLeod, who was in Japan in 1870. He wrote a book called The Epitome of the Ancient History of Japan. And in his, in his book, he wrote that the Meiji Restoration, the imperial, the restor restoration of imperial power was in fact, the return of the Jews. So that is to say, the Meiji, the imperial house, the imperial family was descended from a lost tribe of Israel. So they were Jews, not descent, they were Jewish. Okay. And for that reason, the Meiji restoration is, you know, coming up in Japan was all about uh, the return of the Jews to Japan. Okay. Now he didn't try, the book was not translated into Japanese at the time. So its influence was limited in, um, in Japan. But this is the kind of thing that already from European commentators what was coming early in, 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 the, in Japan's opening. You have other people like Oyabe Zenichiro, who was an educator. And he was also very interested in the Jews and wrote some books about the common ancestry. Now, the reason he was interested partly is because in the late 19th century, 20th century, uh, early 20th century, you have this ascendant discourse about racial, this racial discourse um, that, of course, we take into its its vile lot extreme with, with Hitler and, and Mein Kampf. But, uh, you know, this was something that was in the late 19th century it was ascendant. And he wondered where the Japanese fit into this. Were they white or not quite white? Uh, and he looked at the Jews as well as similar in a similar situation. Are they white? Are they white European or not quite? So he, he saw them as, a, you know, having the similarity, um, not a foil, not as a foil, but as a way to kind of help gauge uh, the Japanese. So he um, was very you know, interested in this idea of where Japanese fit in in this racial, in this racial um, discourse. Then you have Joseph Edelberg, uh, an Israeli uh, researcher, and he has some theories. Uh, he wrote a book called The Japanese and the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel in 1980. Uh, he looked at the, out, the outline of a tab the tabernacle and a Shinto shrine where you have a gate, you have a hand washing place here, Timuzia means hand washing. The holy and the holy of holies, which only the high priest goes into once a year, of course, and the high den in Japan, where you pray, um, but you never get into the home den. You don't go there. You don't even look at it. Um, a Meiji oligarch was assassinated for looking at the imperial gala once behind the, the curtain because uh, it was less majesty. It was you don't look at the imperial regalia. I mean, you, you don't look at that. So he pointed to this, which is again a, a relatively superficial um, observation, I think. But in any case, here is more of these Yamabushi. On the weekends, there's kind of like cosplay almost. They go uh, dress up and climb mountains, engage in all kinds of austerities. Uh, it's called Shugendo. It's a mixture of esoteric Buddhism, Shinto, Taoism, all kinds of folk practices. Uh, here it is, Shugendo. Um, I did this actually once because the school of Kenjutsu, of sword play that I did in Japan was very much connected to these people. So we did a demonstration once and they had the fire walking at this temple and I walked over the fire and it's not bad. If you don't stop and read a newspaper, it's not going to be bad. It doesn't hurt that much. So um, pretty interesting though. So they have these Tengu, right? These mythical beings that are goblins. We have a crow Tengu and you have a Yamabushi Tengu, mountain man Tengu. Uh, with these large, long noses, they, they can fly. They're super fast and strong. They're expert in martial arts. They appear in the, you know, different Japanese legends, stories. And uh, John Wick, also known as Keanu Reeves, in 2017 did a movie, The 47 Ronin, the very famous Japanese story about the 47 Master of Samurai, and this is how they portrayed the Tengu here. Very interesting, a cross between a crow and an owl. Um, and people thought, some people said, oh, the Jews were the Tengu. Okay, so very interesting uh, uh, theories. Now, the, um, the idea of the languages being similar, a little bit of insight and in insight information will um, show that there is no connection. 
So Japanese has three syllabi- or three alphabets, if you want to call them that, or ways of orthography. Orthography is broken into three parts. You have Chinese characters, which are kanji. The same characters are read hanzi in Chinese, Chinese characters. And then you have two phon- uh, phonetic alphabets, uh, hiragana and katakana. And uh, so here he's taking katakana and looking at it and saying, look, the Japanese katakana, these, the, the syllabary, is so close to Hebrew. So there has to be a connection. It's it just really, if you know the origin of hiragana and katakana, you know that they come from Chinese characters. So you have, for example, here's uh, a character, uh, hi, kurabiru, which means to compare. When you write it in cursive fast, it looks like this, and then it looks like this. You can see how this came from that. Uh, this is uh, in benevolence, uh, ren in Chinese or jin in Japanese. It's what Confucius talks about in his writing. And here it's written quickly, and then here he turns into this. You can see a very easy connection. Um, th- this is where here, fu, it's a negator, to, to, to negate a person, to negate something. And then written fast like this, and then like this. So um, ka- hiragana and katakana descend from Chinese characters. And if you know that, then the Hebrew connection really just falls apart. Um, because Chinese characters are attested as early as 1700 BCE. Some people say 1500 BCE, but they were originally etched on, on bones and tortoise shells, which were burned for divination purposes. So the oldest Hebrew shards we have is 10th century BCE. Um, so again, this is kind of grasping at straws, but some people really took to this and wanted, to, wanted this connection to be real. This is another example of how the, uh, char- the characters gave way to these uh, syllabary alphabets. I don't have time to show these movies. They're short clips from YouTube. Um, you, you're w- welcome to look at them, look them up. Um, they, if you type in Jews in Japan, common ancestry, you'll, you'll get those. Um, they're not by scholars or people who, who really understand Japan that well, but just to show you what people are, are, are looking to as you know, reasons for this connection. Um, perhaps some of it's wishful thinking, but uh, they're interesting to watch. Um, not for any, you know, cynical reason, but just to see how people will try to tie the Jews and the Japanese together. Uh, then there's somebody named Saiki Yoshiro who looked to the Hata clan. Okay, the Hata clan is one of the, you know, old clans that came from China through Korea to Japan, written like this, um, in, in combinate and compound the word here, Uzumasa. Uh, this is the character um, actually for the first emperor of China. Um, China was not an empire until 221 BCE. And his era, his dynasty was this character here. And Uzumasa, uh, he put forth as it posit the theory that Uzu means light and Masa means gift in ancient Hebrew. Okay, so he's looking at this. But also, I think the real reason why the Hata clan was thought to be, um, this is the first emperor of China. Sorry, I just wanted to give you some, an image for him to look at. And here's a popular book, Hatashi no Nazutu Yudeji no Torai Densetsu, the, the, the mystery of the Hata as Jews who came over, who crossed over to Japan. And Hata um, had this symbol around, okay, around the shrine, you see the symbol around. Now, that's not so surprising. You, th- you think it might be surprising, because, but then you think back and go, well, the Star of David really was, is more of a modern symbol. It doesn't, it's not a truly ancient symbol the way the menorah or the Lion of Judah is. So, why is why would this be you know in Japan in the seventh century of the common era? And there's a some there's a Hata Kagomimon, which is a mon, a crest of the Hata clan. That's and here it says literally Kago Me, the, the the weave or the, the grain of the basket. So yes, it's a weave, it's a, it's a basket weave. And here you have a star of David. And at Orzion, uh the synagogue I belong to, you have this in the background with you know it's just stars of David that appear in this kind of interlocking pattern of, of, of this wheat. So you see this symbol here everywhere, and it's not a stretch that you see this, you're gonna use that around the shrine as a symbol. So again, the idea that the Star of David was brought to Japan by Jews can be you know, seen through if you understand the, the, the basket weave that was used by the Hatta and other, other people in Japan. Um, Mount Tsuriki, uh, King Solomon's Mines, uh, people thought there was, some people have put forth that Mount Tsuriki and Shikoku is the location of King Solomon's mind. Um, and of course, since Japan is the, one of the homes of the Jews, Shingo in Aomori, the northern part of Japan, uh, there's a belief that Jesus is born here, uh, buried here, because he studied Torah in Japan, because Japan is the place to study Torah. Uh, and then he went back to the Holy Land. And before he was going to be crucified, somebody stood in place for him 
uh, Izukuri, I guess the Japanese name they get, they have. And then he went back to Japan, 4,000 miles, 6,000 miles, four years through Siberia, uh, came back to Japan, married a Japanese woman named Miyuko, had three children, uh, and lived in Japan uh, until the ripe old age of 106. So there's certain events where they celebrate this. And, you know, uh, it's not celebrating Jesus so much as, well, Jews as, you know, Japan is the home of the Jews. That's Jesus is a natural choice uh, to make it his home. And there are some groups that are genuinely uh, very pro-Israel. Uh, Makuya is one of them, uh, founded by Tishima Ikuro. Makuya literally means curtain, structure, tabernacle, is the way it's translated. Uh, and he was a mission, uh, a, a minister who believed in returning to the primitive gospel, he called it. You can see that, say, Mark 12, 29 to 12, 32, said by asked Jesus, what is, the, what is the two most important commandments? And he says the Shema, hero Israel, the, the Lord of God, the Lord is one, you should love with all your heart, soul, and might. And then he says, Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. He saw that as the primitive gospel, the real teaching. Um, and in, today, with, in Japanese, with Japanese Christians, you never hear of substitutionary atonement of the blood is purifying you of your sins. And it doesn't come up in, in conversation with Japanese Christians. Uh, it's it just not really what, it, it's not, and this man especially um, did not look to that. He thought that the church had corrupted the primitive gospel. Uh, they're very visible in Israel, wearing their kimono. Here they are at the Western Wall. Okay, so uh, thank you I, for your attention. Um, before I finish, I just want to get to something I didn't get a chance to read. Uh, just take a minute. Um, I ended right at Giddy for 10 minutes of, of question and answer. Uh, during the war, um, Matsuoka Yosuke, who was the foreign minister of Japan who signed the Axis Pact with Hitler, uh, he wrote to a, a, Jew, a, a Jewish man that he knew, and he, and he said, quote, I first want to assure you that anti-Semitism will never be adopted by Japan. True, I concluded a treaty with Hitler, but I never promised him to be an anti-Semite. And this is not only my personal opinion, but it is the principle of the entire Japanese empire. He also went on to write to Lou Zinkman, a Jewish, a Jewish sugar manufacturer. Uh, and he told him that uh, he was strongly opposed to the persecution of Jews and that if Germany ever demanded that Japan persecute Jews, he would quote, rather tear up the Axis alliance than submit to such a demand. And he, but this man also admitted that the Japanese were descendants of the Jews. So this was part of the, something that brought them, now they wouldn't have persecuted them without that theory, but um, that was one thing that they did hold to and they you know, re refused the uh, Nazi um, insistence on high, firing Jews from the, the Philharmonic. Uh, Rosenstock, Joseph Rosenstock, the conductor of the Tokyo Philharmonic, criticized German music. They had lost some of their talent by you know, persecuting the Jews. One went to Japan. This came out, the Nazis saw it, and they said, fire this guy. He shouldn't be conducting your symphony. And the foreign minister said, it is, we are against any persecution of Jews. You know, we sympathize with them, so we cannot you know, comply with your wishes. So they did always refuse the Nazi um, insistence on, on that. And that's something that they do today feel a great deal of pride about. But anyway, thank you for your attention. That's what, this is from a different presentation. It says here, thank you for your attention uh, with a nice little uh, Japanese style bow. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. And um, uh, thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was very, very interesting. We'd love to take a couple of questions. Um, I only saw one come in, in the chat, which was, can you talk about the Makuya, which I know you got you right at the end there. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to raise your hands um, and then we can call on people and unmute or you can write them in the chat. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, the Makuya um, are, again, there's a lot of new religious groups in Japan. There's an enormous number for people who, are supposedly not religious because again, this is interesting when you do surveys of what religion you are and these are conducted by other agencies, it's not really a Japanese idea. What are you, right? Meaning what religion you are. Um, but you know, they have 180 million responses for 120, 130 million population because people are checking more than one box. Um, and then one that's very common is Mushikyo, no religion. Yet there's an enormous number of new religions in Japan, incredible number. I was living in Japan in 1995 when we had the sarin gas attack. Um, one of the new religions was trying to bring about the, the, the apocalypse, and they had, you know, 6,000 people were sickened, 13 were killed, that whole omushimi kill, that famous event. So there's a large number of new religions. Makuya is just one of them, okay? There's other ones like this that deal, that, that are very pro-Israel, pro-Jewish. But the Makuya, Ma Makuya is interesting because 
they do learn Hebrew. They go to Israel. They live on Kibbutzim. Uh, they, during the, the Six Day War, they, uh, Kishima made a point to support Israel in every way they could, both in Japan and you know, bringing people to Israel. He, they're very pro-Israel, but without the idea that you find among a lot of evangelicals that Israel must return to the homeland in order to be destroyed in the war of Gog and Magog and then apocalypse and then Jesus comes back. Great, right? That's the discourse you see a lot with some evangelicals. But in Japan with like Makuya, uh, there isn't the idea that Israel must be destroyed. Israel must be in a war. This is not part of that whole paradigm. It's very genuine. They, they are Christians nominally. They, call it, they consider themselves Christians but they follow the primitive gospel, which means what? Well, they're Christians, but you know the founder of Christianity was Jewish, uh, as was the codifier, Paul. I mean, some people have not think he was, uh, he was not Jewish, but let's just go with that Paul was Jewish. So of course, the whole story, the biblical story, including if you consider that the Bible, is also Jews, right? So he sees Christianity as an inheritor of Jewish ethics, Jewish Jew, Judaism. Uh, Jesus was a Jew. So they, you know, that's where that sense of camaraderie comes from. Um, it's not opposed to Judaism. It's not replacing Judaism. It's not the New Testament. It, it's the primitive gospel. Um, like I said earlier with, with Mahayana and Hinayana Buddhism, unlike Mahayana and Hinayana, where the great vehicle and the small vehicle, you can still have the small vehicle. But in the Christian paradigm, you have the New Testament, which supersedes the Old Testament. You sure you need the Old Testament? Yeah, sure, sure, for this and this. But it's the New Testament where you get your salvation in the Christian scheme. So that's a difference that you don't have in Buddhism, um, and that is done away with 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 mafia. It's not um, again the idea of substitutionary substitutionary atonement and the, the central doctrines of the, of the Church in the West are not um, at all part of the the, the, the religious life of the mafia um, adherents. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a very interesting group, and, and there's other ones uh, in as well. Um, but um, new religions, new religions in Japan are very interesting because there's so many of them, and you can find pretty much anything anything you want, everything under the sun. Really, it's very interesting. But thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question that I saw come in was, can you mention? Sorry, can you mention the thought of making a Jewish state in Manchuria or elsewhere? The idea of making a Jewish state wasn't from as far as I know, um, and there's some things I don't know, obviously, was never really bandied about. Um, I mean, the, the idea of Jews being safe there, Jews being looked after, there might have been, I remember coming across something, somebody said something about the Jews not making it their new homeland, not like this, the story about Uganda, you're, you're going to get a, you know, we're going to carve out an area in Africa, which would be your, your homeland. It wasn't, or Russia, where there have been a couple of places like that, but Manchuria, as far as I know, um, was never seriously entertained um, as, as you know, perhaps instead of Israel making the home, you know, their home there. I think it's just too volatile. You know, you ha you're in between the Japanese empire, the Russian, um, of course, Japan took over Manchuria, uh, Russia uh, uh, later on, of course, pushed Japan out and declared war on Japan at the end of World War II. Um, and the Jews would be in a precarious position under Russian rule. And Japanese rule, who knows how long that would go for, right? I mean, it's, it's so, as far as I know, Manchuria was never really discussed as a possible um, alternative, but you did have a serious community. 13,000 people is a serious community, you know, um, enough to have hospitals, schools, synagogues, um, you know, kosher deli, not deli, kosher um, meat, you get kosher food. Uh, so, um, but yeah, it, it's an interesting idea though, that maybe under J Japanese rule, if Japanese rule, say, continued and Northern China remained part of the Japanese empire, would the Jews have had, you know, a, a chance to flourish there? Uh, I don't know, because when Israel was established, um, you have a, fe I have a feeling that just like many Russian Jews tried, got, went, went, to, went to Israel, emigrated when they could, uh, you know, Russia would eventually take, 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 you know, and China, of course, the Chinese government um, went under Mao, um, just not a really safe place to be, I think, for a large community. So I, I don't know if it would have persisted, but it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for just one more question. I'm sorry to everyone whose questions we can't get to, uh, just going in the order that they came in to try to be the most fair. Um, so the last one will be, can you 
Uh, please say more about why some think that Japanese have common ancestors with Jews. Um, well, there's the one the one to look at today. Um, this is a discourse that was, you know, fostered by a number of authors and thinkers, not a huge number, but it was taken up by a decent number of people. And the main ones are, like I mentioned, a few people like Edelberg wrote that book and he has a lot of linguistic ideas. Kino Tora. Kin no Tora is in the Jap in the Chinese like astronomical cycle of days and weeks. It's a very you know Byzantine system. It's so complex, and I don't even feel confident describing the whole cycle of the sixty years and the different animals associated with each. So Kin no Tora is a you know a, a year according to the cycle. The tiger, this and anyway, and then he was, oh Kin no Tora is a year in Japan Japanese history, but that's not the Kine Tora. Kine Torah, which means Torah reads. So there must be a connection between. So he's taking these linguistic, you know, um, similarities and and take and, and using this as his right basis. I think that gave rise to a lot of other ideas. There are people that say the Tengu, right? The Tengu, those mythical beings that have a little, you know, uh, sake cup on their head. They have this long nose. They're supernatural. People don't really see them. Uh, maybe those are the Jews. Um, you know, there's a lot of theories about. Some people say the kappa, these kind of like almost uh, turtle-like beings that are it's very strange. One guy I met told me he thought the Jews came over as kappa. Kappa are these, again, these, these turtle-like humans that made it, it's really bizarre. Um, so I, I don't think there's much that's really you could hang your hat on for any kind of historical connection. I had a, somebody I knew 30 years ago who thought that, he said to me, oh, you're Jewish, you Japanese guys. Like, oh, wow. Um, well, I got to be your bodyguard because someday you're going to talk about and reveal the real connection between Jews and Japan and people are going to try to assassinate you. And I remember like 10 years later, he sent me a package. I got no, over 10 years later. Uh, the internet had come out and everything. And he found where I was. He sent me a package and he addressed it to the 266th generation king of Israel. So, I mean, there's all kinds of theories out there, many different ideas. But um, it's it, it's there's not nothing that I think I could point to as something that is suggestive of, of a connection between the Jews and the Japanese, as far as what I've seen so far. Thank you so much. This has been a really, really interesting presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, just want to let you all know about our next event, which will be August 24th at 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, we'll be hearing from David Lieberman on Transcendental Judaism, hearing the still small voice. So hope you can all tune into that as well. And uh, thank you again. Have a great day.